Thank you, Gary. Our next speaker is Edward Francis. Ed is the Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial Banking Officer for Hancock Holding Company. He also serves on their Executive Committee. Hancock Holding Company is a $20 billion financial services firm, primarily with two banks, Hancock Bank and Whitney Bank. After Hurricane Katrina, Ed served with Louisiana Department of Economic Development to develop small business emergency loan programs. He's also lobbied in Washington on behalf of the Gulf Coast region on issues facing the region after Katrina. He's an Ole Miss graduate in managerial finance. He's also a graduate from Louis, uh, the LSU School of Banking. He's also served as a faculty member for both Ole Miss and Alabama Schools of Banking. He's a past president of Coastal Conservation Association in Louisiana. He serves on the grant making committee for the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. And Ed, I waited till the last minute to tell him that you're from Baton Rouge just to give you a chance with this, with this crowd. So it, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Francis. Awesome. Yes, it's true. I do live in Baton Rouge, so I keep a very low profile there. It's really an honor to be here with you today, uh, to think back 26 or 27 years ago, to be sitting in your seats, and like Gary was saying, you know, what was I going to do with my life, and to be up here and to have the opportunity to share my experience and, and the experience of my companies that I've worked with with you. It's a great honor. It really is. You know, this university, Dean, the Dean was talking about this, but I want to tell you this. You have a great opportunity. Ole Miss students stand out. It's not because they're smarter than everybody else. It's really because of what this, this culture, the culture that this university has created over the last 166 years. <clears throat> Whoops, let me go back here. I'm gonna tell you, when you go out in the job force, you will stand out. You ought to have confidence. Um, the, the university, through its history, the, um, and I can't tell you exactly what it is, but it's culture. And I'm gonna talk about this about our companies too, but there's a culture here that really helps you stand out as an individual. Um, I see students come out, and it really is about the relationships. I think it comes from, you know, whether it's the fraternity parties or the sorority parties or it's the, it's the Grove or it's the tight-knit community of Oxford. There's this family environment here that creates a special kind of person. And I've watched Ole Miss students, Ole Miss students come out, and I've watched them excel. And so you ought to feel very confident when you come out of this program that you're going to have opportunities. It might not be the star job that you think you're going to get. We all think we're going to get when we graduate. But I promise you, if you have passion about what you do and you like, you like what you're doing in your career, you will stand out because of the background of what you've learned from this university. So <clears throat> I want to go through a few things. And uh, I'm going I'm to tell some stories, and I'm going to try to help you understand kind of what, what I've been through in my life. Uh, but my main objectives here today are really, really to inspire you to do something great. There's an incredible opportunity in this world today. It's truly global. Um, no matter what you want to do, whether it's in, if it's in Oxford, Mississippi, or if it's in Paris, France, or if it's in Hong Kong, there are truly uh, worldly opportunities out there for you. So, like Gary said, it's very important for you to find your passion. Okay? Also, set high expectations. Have a dream for yourself. It'll be amazing what you, think you, you, what you don't think you can accomplish that you actually can. I'm going to talk about a little bit about being a leader and some trials and tribulations that I've gone through, some mistakes that I've made along the way. Um, also going to talk about change um, and how you embrace change and actually how you, how you uh, rise when you have the opportunity through change. And lastly, I'm going to talk about courage and, and uh, how to overcome fear. So I want to give you some history about our company. Um, you know, hi history is, if I could come back and, and study again, I would love to study history. I don't think it's a predictor of the future, but I think it helps us understand how to deal with the future. And so one of the things I want to take you back and talk about our company and some of the things we've been through and some of the trials and tribulations that the company's been through and things that I've been through personally that hopefully will make you your experience and as you grow, uh, it'll help you uh, in that career. This bank was founded in 1899 in Hancock County, Mississippi. And many of you know where that is. It's still, still a very rural part of this state. Uh, it was founded with $10,000 in capital. Uh, and $8,000 in first day deposits. What was going on in Hancock County at that time was there was a big lumber trade, there was a, a wool trade, and there needed, there needed to be a bank there in that part of the world. And so uh, many founders of, uh, ironically, the Whitney Bank were the same founders and shareholders of the, Han of the Hancock Bank. And so we'll talk about that commonality here in a little while. Um, but that bank was founded there in 1899. Um, our bank prospered in the Roaring Twenties. And then in, in October 29, 1929, the infamous stock market crash happened. 
in the next couple of years, 162 banks in Mississippi failed. Think about that, 162 banks in Mississippi failed. Here's Hancock Bank. I don't know exactly the size, but I bet you we were probably five, six million dollars in total assets at the time. Um, every bank in Gulfport, Mississippi had failed, the center of commerce for the coast. Um, at that time, the Gulfport business people needed a bank, so they appealed to the, to the Hancock County Bank to open an office in Hancock County, Mississippi. This is 1932. You know what was going on at that point in time. You think about those folks and the shareholders, are we really going to open a bank during the Great Depression? Well, they did. They, they moved a bank to, to, uh, to Gulfport, Mississippi. Our, our headquarters today is not very far from this building. Uh, in 1939, we changed the name to Hancock Bank. And that building today survived Camille, it survived Katrina, and it's still owned by our company. We built a tower next to it, but that bank today houses some of our associates in it. Um, so we moved to headquarters to, to Gulfport. It actually it says 32 there, but it's actually 1939. And so through, through some of the worst economic times, as Gary was talking about, our bank has prospered. And I'm, I'm going to go over that theme today and talk about it a little bit more. Um, during the next 25 years or so, um, and, and we, did, we did weather, Camille, I want to talk about that a little bit too, but between 1973 and 1998, we acquired 14 other banks along the Mississippi Gulf Coast and in, in Louisiana, and our assets grew from $158 million to $2.7 billion. Um, these acquisitions became, became of opportunities to acquire uh, institutions on the coast, but a lot of them came because of what was happening in the Mississippi and Louisiana and Texas economies in the middle, middle 80s. And what was happening there is we had an oil bust going on. Um, and so what was going on is you had bank failures happening. And so we were having opportunities because of our strength, we were having opportunities to acquire banks and to grow in the worst of economic times. Um, so we grew, grew the bank that way, we grew it organically, and some of our markets in uh, Mississippi we have upwards of 50% market share. Um, so that theme about the bank historically growing, growing, the worst, worst, growing the most in the worst economic times in the aftermath of disasters. After Katrina, um, actually I'm going to talk about this. After uh, Camille, our bank in the next year doubled in size. Okay? It doubled in size. So what happened is Katrina, I mean, I get the storms mixed up. Camille came through in 1969, wiped out the coast. We thought at that point in time that was the worst storm of the, of the century, right? The next year, the bank grew organically, doubled in size. Okay, so remember that point. And I want to make this point to you, too. And I want you to, want you to think about this. In the midst of failure, opportunities surround you. Think about what Gary did back in 2008. You need to prepare yourself for the economic cycles and the cycles of life. Leaders are born from these situations. Okay? Think about those things. A little bit about myself. I enrolled uh, in Ole Miss in 1984. I was an accounting major. I don't know why I was an accounting major, really. It wasn't a passion of mine. It was actually something my grandfather wanted me to pursue. I think I had more passion and interest in the co-eds than I did in accounting. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I, I, didn't, I, really wasn't, I really wasn't focused uh, my first couple of years here. I really didn't like it. And then I went through intermediate accounting, and I knew I wasn't going to be an accountant. It was not my passion, and it was not my best subject. Let me just say that. Um, in the, uh, in the fall semester of my junior year, which would be 1986, I uh, took my first finance course. And there was a lady, a young professor by the name of Miss McLean. And Ken, I'd like to, do you know her? Is she still here? I would like to find her because this lady changed my life. She, uh, she was in a classroom, probably two, three, maybe 400 students. And her passion and the way that she ran that class and the discipline and, the, and, the, and the, just, just everything about her really inspired me to be a student inspired me to pursue something that I wanted to do, to study hard, to focus. And uh, it's really amazing that people, you'll come across people in your lives, when you least expect it, expect it, right? And this lady really did change my life. And uh, over the next two years, my GPA greatly improved, my focus greatly improved, and I found my passion. I knew I wanted to be in banking. I moved to Memphis and, uh, in uh, 1989, and I took a job with, uh, with National Bank of Commerce. Um, you, you see, I, I joined in 1989, so I stayed an extra football season. Just, you know, took a few classes to make sure I could stay w one more semester. Um, but in that, in that time period, back, in, back home, back in New Orleans where I grew up, uh, the oil bust was, was there. There were no jobs. Um, I interviewed with every bank and nobody was hiring. I said, can I just come to work for free? I'll do anything. 
there were really no jobs back then in that part of the world. So I moved to Memphis and uh, I became a collector. I said, I'll take any job you have, just give me an opportunity. And so my first job out of, out of college was to work in the collections department of this bank. So here I am, a college graduate, think I'm gonna have this big job and I'm collecting past due loans, okay? I'm making $14,000 a year and I'm literally eating bologna sandwiches for lunch because I can't afford to go out to eat lunch. It's been a long time since I had a bologna sandwich, but that's, that's what my life was like. But I knew what I wanted to do, and I was willing to make the sacrifices to prove that I could do it. And many of you are going to face that same thing. The job market is tough, but if you find what you want to do, take an opportunity, prove yourself, and you will get more opportunities, I promise you. Um, I, I, uh, after about six months, my, uh, my uh, boss at the time uh, saw what I was doing. He recommended, for, recommended, for a, recommended me for a job as an assistant branch manager in a super money market. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but that's the in-store bank branches, okay? At the time, National Maker Commerce, lucky for me, was an was a, um, innovator in this business. They were, they were probably one of the first banks to do it and to do it well. They were traveling around the country, signing contracts with, uh, with grocery store chains and doing consulting work with banks to help them learn this concept to learn how to, how, to, how to be in a grocery store and how to attract customers to a bank. One of the things that we have a hard time with in today's world is getting customers to come to our bank, right? So the idea was to, if you were in a supermarket, we had people coming in all the time, right? We had, we had moms and dads coming to get milk, and so we had this opportunity to interact with clients a whole lot more. And I learned a lot from that company. It was, it was a very lucky opportunity for me to learn from an innovator at a very long, young age. Um, I, uh, after about a year, I got to be a manager. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in a very good, lo good location. We won lots of awards. I learned lots of lots of things. But I knew that wasn't ultimately what I wanted, wanted to be. I didn't want to be a retail banker for the rest of my life. I really wanted to be in commercial banking. So I would let anybody in the company know, hey, I really am interested in doing this. So after a year or so, I got an opportunity to go into the commercial training program. I worked at Metropolitan Banking, which is really a middle market banking uh, uh, floor at National Bank of Commerce, and I learned commercial banking. Learned it from some really great mentors. And, uh, and I worked in, uh, in basically uh, large industrial clients, and I spent two or three years there learning that. Had an opportunity in uh, 1993, I was recruited away by First Tennessee Bank. And the reason I went to First Tennessee is because of this, uh, of this guy that recruited me. I said, really, I can learn a lot from this gentleman. And, uh, and I really did learn a lot from him. He inspired me to be better than I could be. He knew, that, he knew that I had potential and he saw it in me and he encouraged, encouraged me to do it. It's something that I've learned from him that I've passed on to folks that I, uh, that I work with today. Um, you will find mentors in your life, people that really like you, see something in you and encourage you. and They'll help you spread your wings. And, uh, and so this is somebody, ironically, that I work with today closely. Um, you know, 25 years later, he's, uh, he owns his own consulting business and I'm an EVP of a bank. Well, you know, at 30 years old, I'm not sure either one of us really realized it, but I think we both dreamed of it. So um, it's, it's ironic how you, you know, you meet people in, the, in your world. Um, I joined Hancock Bank in 1997, and, uh, and I'll tell a little bit of that story uh, too, because there's some valuable lessons here. So here I am, 31 years old. I've worked for two really great companies and some really great mentors. So I walk into this bank, at the time, we were probably about two and a half billion dollars in assets, and I'm a commercial banker, and uh, I immediately saw opportunity. And the reason I took the job at uh, Hancock, I had many other offers, lots of them for more money, but I saw a big opportunity. Uh, the bank was very well capitalized, very liquid, very well run, very conservative. I had some history with the company, knew a lot of folks in it, and, I, and they were undergoing a, a management transition. Um, you know, the, upper, the senior manager was getting up in age, and I thought, you know, this is an opportunity for me long-term to really prove myself and have a long-term opportunity. Um, but as a 31-year-old coming in and, and thinking about new ideas and talking about here's, here's ways we can streamline business, here's incentive plans we can bring in, here's a new way to do business, there were lots of bankers there. This is a lesson I learned. There were a lot of bankers there, bankers there that were, you know, they were they had been in banking longer than I'd been alive. Let's just say that. Okay. So the lesson I learned is, instead of instead of coming in with both guns a blazing, right? I should have spent some time really earning their trust and thinking about their ideas and how to mold them. Um, it's a lesson that I learned later on in life, and I, I really applied it during the Whitney acquisition. And I'll talk about that uh, in a second. But uh, it was a, it was a pretty it was a pretty valuable lesson as a young person, and uh, didn't win a, didn't win a lot of friends. Um, and so I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do here, right? 
Well, this was a very old institution, and, uh, and we still had senior loan committee where the CEO and the full board uh, came in, and we sat at this big table. I'll just describe this to you. It's a, it's a big V table with an apex, and at the, at the head of the table sat the chairman of the board and the board members, right? Well, my first loan committee, I come in, and you're under this light, literally under this light, and you're on the inside of this apex. And uh, Leo Seal, if you know who Leo Seal is, he's an icon of the banking world. Um, just an incredible man that, uh, that, really, that really was an icon in Mississippi Bank and in, in uh, the United States. Big football player from Mississippi State. And so we're there for the first, my first loan presentation. I said, man, is this, is this a loan presentation or is this a court martial? It was an incredibly intimidating experience. And I thought about it. I said, you know, if I'm intimidated and I've got a commercial banking background, what do other folks in the organization look like? You know, how do they feel about this? And so I started asking around and inquiring. And I, and I learned that people in our branches were intimidated by the process. And so when somebody came in and said, hey, I'd like to talk about a commercial loan, they were like, well, we, we don't really do that business. I said, man, here's a huge opportunity. And so I, I brought senior management an idea about forming a business banking group, about, about having a group of folks that could actually go out and support the branches and do the business uh, and support them. And so I brought that to senior management, and I got an opportunity to start a business banking group at Hancock Bank. Okay, so here I am. Now I'm really kind of competing with the old guard because I've got my own, my own group that I formed, right? And so you've got this old guard here that's, that's you know, watching what we're doing. So we had, we had a lot of success. We were, we were working with, uh, with branch folks from Pascagoula all the way to uh, Bay St. Louis, and, uh, and we were growing, the, growing the, the business very well. And uh, I could tell that uh, there, wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of fans other than the customers and the folks in the branches. And I'm sitting here thinking, okay, <clears throat> this is not going very well. You know, and here's my analogy, if, uh, if any of you are runners, you know, if you're in a race and the guy in front of you picks up the pace, right, if you want to stay, if you want to stay and, and have a chance to win that race, you've got to pick your pace up, right? You've got to pick your pace up also. Well, you're going to find people in your career that don't want you to pick up the pace. They're going to be naysayers. They're going to try to hold you back. And the reason why is because you're causing them to run faster, okay? And I want you to realize this. You're going to, you're going to recognize this. And so I recognized this, that this was going on inside the company. And I said, you know, what am I going to do here? I don't have a whole lot of tenure. These guys have been around here 30 years. How am I going to, how am I going to do this, right, and survive? Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of things going on, a lot of folks making up stories, and, and it, was a, it was a very tough time for me. Um, <clears throat> we had bought a bank in 1990 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And for the, over the, that 10-year period, the bank hadn't really done very well. Uh, it was littered with the skeletons of lots of executives that went over there uh, but didn't have a whole lot of success. And uh, being from Louisiana, I said, well, maybe that's my opportunity. Maybe I ought to ask senior management if I can go over to Baton Rouge and see if I can have an opportunity to run that market. So in 1990, I asked for the opportunity to go to Baton Rouge so that we can put the innovation in, that we can do the things that we wanted to do to see if we can grow that market. And we did very well. And I'm proud to say that over, over the, you know, the next seven or eight years, um, leading up to the Whitney acquisition, actually it's about 10 years, leading up to the Whitney acquisition, uh, that time, that, uh, that market had become 40% of our total bank assets. It was the largest loan portfolio inside the bank. It aided a lot in, in, the, uh, in the growth of our company, the, uh, the strong capital position we had, and really the strong stock price that we had that, that really served us well over time. And so, and I didn't do that on my own, let me tell you, that was because we had a great team. And, but it was, it was also because we saw an opportunity uh, and we had the courage and we, and, we, and we did something with it. And so I want to intertwine those things into you. Um, that, in, that opportunity impacted my career and it catapulted my career. A few years later, about four years later, I got I received responsibility uh, to run commercial banking for the holding company. Uh, and so that went very well and it really, it really was the single decision in my career that gave me the opportunity to shine. And, uh, and so um, <clears throat> in August 29th, August 29, 2005, the world changed. Hurricane Katrina comes through, and I can remember this. We were sitting in an executive uh, strategic planning session the, the Friday before, and uh, one of the executives, I'll, I'll, I'll leave his name, uh, I won't say his name, I guess, although he did go to Mississippi State, um, says, this is, this is going to be nothing. It's going to blow over. We're going to have blue skies by Monday morning. Well, you know what? He was right. We had blue skies on Monday morning, okay? But this is what our bank looked like on Tuesday morning. In this, in this company, think about it now, we're a $6 billion bank with assets from Tallahassee, Florida through Baton Rouge. And we had just lost our IT shop, our, 
deposit operations shop and our loan operations shop. Everything was housed in that one building. And so people talk about disaster planning. We were, we were in the midst of a disaster. And we were looking at, the, at really the face and, and potentially the death of our company if we couldn't get back up and running. So here's what we did. Um, we immediately went into action. We took our backup files and went to Chicago to a uh, company that called, named by the name of SunGuard, who was our disaster recovery, basically computer uh, system. We plugged those files in. We, uh, we, we worked with our friends at Trustmark. I think there's some Trustmark folks here. We called them up and said, hey, <laughs> we need some proof machines. They sent a bunch of proof machines down. We started running proof machines in an old building um, that, that didn't receive any damage. Um, and we got a loan operation shop, so we were uh, back up and running. We were making loans on handshakes and literally on the back of na napkins. I promised to pay you $10,000. And that's how we did business for a while. Um, within a week or so, we got our bank up and running. You know, we had, we had customers that were affected that were in Tallahassee that wanted to come to the bank, but they couldn't get their balance. We couldn't run. We couldn't process the bank. And so if we couldn't process the bank, you know, eventually that would mean we would fail. Somebody would have to come over and take us over. And so by Friday that week, we got, we got everything restored and we were back in business. Now, when I say back in business, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a I mean, it was like being in a third world country. Um, and you talk about leadership that, that comes from a disaster and what our associates, what they, the, what they rose to the occasion. Many of these folks didn't even have houses, but they showed up to work. This is a picture of a lady literally laundering money. <laughs> and, and I mean this. And the reason why we were laundering money is because we couldn't get anybody to deliver any cash to us. And this is a cash society now, right? Credit card machines are not working. There's no power. You know, people aren't taking checks. So it's a cash society. And, uh, and so what we did is we went to all our branches that were destroyed. They were just literally safe sitting there, okay? Flooded by water. They were, it was muddy, nasty, stinky money. And we put it into washing machines. We washed it, we dried it, and we ironed it. We had our CEO of the company. Many of you all know George Slogel. He's driving it around, delivering it to branches in the back of his trunk. But that's what you do in a disaster. And that's what I mean is that leadership, in the face of disaster, leaders shine. And so it was really an incredible opportunity. It, you can tell it kind of makes me emotional to talk about it. But in the next year, organically, our company grew a billion dollars. Okay, remember after, after Camille, we doubled in size. Well, we grew organically a billion dollars the next year. That's what our building looks like now today. Um, and so from there, we catapulted into what has been a really incredible run over the last, last 10 years, so to speak. Um, and then in 2008, when Gary started his firm, we had, this, uh, we had this financial crisis come upon us, right? So what are we going to do here? We've got banks falling all, failing all around us. We've got you know, situations where um, the, uh, the TARP money is being created because if, if banks don't get TARP, they're going to fail. Well, I'm proud to say that we didn't take any TARP. Um, it's a slogan that we, uh, we were proud to say. And not, we did not lose money during any one reported quarter during the financial crisis. Um, and that comes from some of the uh, founding um, core values that I'm going to talk about in a second of our company. But it created huge opportunity for us. And so we were, at this point in time, about $8 billion in assets. Okay, so think about this. In about 2008, we're about $8, $8 billion in assets. Um, the next year, December of 2009, we acquired a failed bank in Panama City, Florida, People's Bank, a billion-dollar bank, put us into markets like uh, 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 Orlando and Jacksonville and filled out our panhandle markets, and it was, a, it was a great opportunity for us. And then in December of 2011, late on a Sunday eve, we were getting ready to do a deal that would change the landscape of our company forever. It would teach me some valuable lessons as a leader. We were getting ready to, to acquire and merge with the legendary Whitney Bank. This is an icon of banking, okay? At this time, Whitney Bank was 50% larger in assets than our, than our company. So here, what is this little community bank in Gulfport, Mississippi doing buying uh, Whitney Bank? Well, ironically, as I talked about, we had had you know, similar, similar founders. We had had similar employees. We knew each other. And many of the times, the hard economic times before, we had lent, money, lent many Whitney money um, to help him. So we had this relationship. And we had an opportunity. Whitney, Whitney Management actually called us to come in and see if we would be interested in buying that bank. And so here we are, getting ready to do a deal that would change the landscape of our company. 
Um, so here's true humility. And I, here I am thinking about change, right? I'm a guy that's grown up. I'm getting ready to be in, in charge of a bunch of le le legendary Whitney bankers. And their legend is true. I mean, some very, very highly skilled people. I mean, their, their knowledge of the, of the large industrial base was incredible, especially oil and gas business. And what is it going to me, mean for me? You know, in acquisitions, what I will tell you, if you're ever in, in an acquisition, a lot of times people inwardly focus and they think, okay, what is this going to mean for me, right? Well, that was no different. You know, was I going to keep my job? What was going to happen? You know, was I going to, was I going to be able to, to say on the management committee? What, what, all those things that kind of go through your head. So what did I do? I kind of I took a step back. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go about this with a lot of humility. I'm going to learn to know those guys. I'm going to, I'm going to learn to, uh, to help uh, get their trust, to earn their trust. And so we went to work, right? Um, and what, what I will tell you is here, and we're going to talk about adapting to change, but going through, going through mergers, those that adapt to change are the ones that survive, okay? We have integrated over the last four years, uh, we've integrated two companies into what is now becoming really the predominant bank of the Gulf South. So we have taken the best of their culture and the best of our culture and combined them. And I'm proud to say that I kept my job. Um, I've, actually, uh, I've actually grown in my responsibilities. Um, I now sit on, uh, sit on the, uh, the management committee of the company, the top seven executives of the company. I have responsibility for commercial banking, um, and I have responsibility for geographic regions stretching from Florida to Texas. And it really has been an incredible experience, and we really feel great, great about, uh, about where we are. I want to I go over these core values with you because these are the backbone of our company. These were founded well before any of the executive management team was in place. And these have, these have, have, have been something that have been a steadfast of our company. They are honor integrity, strength and stability, commitment to service, teamwork, and personal responsibility. And I will tell you that when we have a tough decision to make, when we're thinking about acquiring a bank or if we're thinking about a tough decision, we test ourselves against these core values. And I would challenge you as an individual, what are your core values? What do you stand for? You know, um, do what you want to do in this life. And if you, have, if you have the grit and you have the passion and you understand what you are, like Gary said, I think you can be very successful. So let's talk about those five things that I mentioned early on. Two minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go quickly. All right, find your passion. Love what you do, and it seldom seems like work. Okay? Nobody wants to work. It's a long career, right? You've got to work 30, 40 years. Love what you do. Understand that life is a balancing act. We're not going to look back in uh, 30 years and wish we'd have worked harder. You know, I wish I'd have spent more time with my kids is what I would tell you. Um, and, I, and, again, don't let money be your only, only motivator. Early on, you want to make money. I know all of you are hungry to make money because you want to buy a house, you want to start a family. But if you have your passion, um, money at, at a point in your life is going to become less important. What's going to be important is are you doing the things that you want to do with your life. So um, just remember that. Set high expectations. Chart your, chart your path and have your own vision. Share your ambitions with others and listen to their counsel. Find mentors that are willing to talk to you and listen to them. Um, discredit the naysayers. There will be people that will try to, you know, if you're pulling ahead, they will try to, just the way human nature is, they will try to knock you down. And I'll tell you this, is that let work ethic overcome shortcomings and abilities. When I look at folks that I want to hire, you know, yes, I want them to be smart. I don't, I'm not looking for brilliance, but I'm looking for people who are very well balanced, who work hard, who have been involved in lots of activities. Those are the folks who really shine in companies because they have the passion and they have the work ethic to make things happen. Be a leader. Um, lead with confidence in whatever your role, whether you're a bill collector, uh, whether you're a manager, whether you're an executive, um, lead with confidence. I'm going to give you a tip here. Hone your skills through community leadership. There are all kinds of opportunities out there to get involved in community organizations or non-for-profits. It's a great way to, to learn how to become a leader. If you can lead in a non-profit for folks who are, who are there because they want to be there, um, not because they're getting paid, you can't fire them, uh, you can develop some really good leadership school, skills by being involved in those. I would ask you to learn, uh, to listen, and to stay humble. You know, one of, the, one of the lessons I learned early on in life is, you know, as a, as a young person, sometimes you've got to remain humble and you've got to learn how to listen. Um, and then lastly is be an agile leader. Um, be willing to take on any assignment. If somebody asks you to do something, even though it's not what you want to do, go do it and be successful because you're going to get another shot. I want to make sure, I'm going to 
focus on this for a second, okay? Change. The one thing I can promise you today is that all of you will go through change, okay? Change is just a fact of life. And change that you create by getting married, deciding to take a job, uh, moving somewhere, those are changes you create. But you're also going to have change because of things that are forced upon you. Natural disasters, e economic recessions, companies getting sold, etc. As an individual, I would ask you to embrace change. You can excel. Um, most folks don't adapt to change well. Change management is a big issue in companies because it's so hard to do. But those that adapt to it, I promise you, will have an opportunity to excel. And lastly, um, have courage and conquer fear. You know, when I was preparing for this, I have this, there's sometimes things just happen, right? Things come to you. I don't know where it comes from. I believe with my faith that they're God-given. They're God but I was preparing for this, and this comes across an email. I don't even know who it came from. But I thought it was so powerful, I wanted to share it with you today. Um, to be fearless no matter what happens. This is the root of true happiness, right? To move forward resolutely regardless of what lies in store. That is a spirit, the resolve that leads to human victory. But if we allow ourselves to be disrupted by petty criticism and slander, naysayers, if we fear pressure and persecution, we will never advance or create anything of lasting value. I want you to think about this. <clears throat> what if James Meredith had decided not to come to Ole Miss? What if his fear kept him from going here? What if those bankers back in the 30s had decided they didn't want to open that branch in Gulfport, Mississippi? What if you were fearful of your GMAT? I didn't want to take it. So you didn't get the opportunity to be an MBA. What if we were fearful of acquiring Whitney Bank, a bank that was almost, you know, 50% larger than us? Overcome your fears, spread your rings and soar. It's a great opportunity out there. It really is. So I want to leave you with that. Hopefully we have some time for questions and answers. Um, but uh, it really is an honor to be here with you today and share this, uh, this experience in your MBA program. So questions? I'm going to walk over and get some water like this. Hey, Gary. Appreciate you showing me up at the uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> Another key to success is surround, surround yourself with people who are a lot smarter than you are. So I have a similar question that I was asked as well. I guess from the industry as a whole, uh, obviously there's been a lot of consolidation. Uh, so two things we're seeing. So I'm curious as to what the plans are for your bank. And I know you probably have to disclaim a lot of things since we cover you on research. Yeah, it's a good question. So let me, let me claim Safe Harbor here because Gary does cover our stock. It's interesting, Gary and I were in Memphis at the same time and we're friends and here we are back here together. So it's, uh, it's good to see an old friend and a guy that uh, is, a, is a fan of our company. Um, I do see con continued consolidation in the industry. Um, and a big part of it is the fact that the regulatory environment is incredibly burdensome, incredibly burdensome. I cannot tell you how many tens of millions of dollars we're spending today in regulatory compliance. And you're seeing it all over. You're watching the news. You're seeing banks that can't acquire banks because they've got a problem with CRA or BSA. I mean, it's just the regulatory burden today. The pendulum has swung way too far. Um, you think about the Durban Act, okay? The Durban Act and, and the debit, debit card uh, interchange income, that cost our bank literally about $50 million in revenue. $50 million in revenue. And it was because of the retailers, right? Target and Home Depot, all those guys were saying we were charging too much. Well, guess who's taking the losses on, that, on those frauds there? They're not taking them. We're taking them. And so the regulatory environment, what's going on, I'm kind of getting off the subject and preaching a little bit because it, it's an aggravating thing, but it really is burdensome today. And for those small banks, if you don't have scale, uh, it's really hard to keep up with. So does that answer your question? I think, that, uh, I think there will be plenty of opportunities out there for acquisitions. Yes, sir. Well, that's a good question. So the question was, would you contribute our success after Camille and, and Katrina to, to um, being nimble, so to speak? And what was the other part of the question? Our thorough, uh, our thorough uh, uh, disaster planning. Well, let me say this first, disaster planning. We had a disaster plan, no doubt about it. Um, it was tested, but it really, you know, it never had been tested like we went through. You know, oh, yeah, we're going to have a problem. But, you know, we went through the motions and, and tested it. But... We know, we know natural disasters now. In fact, many companies calling us for expertise. 
to help them in the disaster planning. But I will tell you, um, that helped us get the company back up and running, having a plan. But what really uh, helped us is the fact that we were nimble. We went to action quickly um, to help our customers, right? We were reaching out to them. We were running ads in the paper to say, hey, if you need to contact your banker, we were running ads in the Houston paper, in Dallas paper, Atlanta, you know, Destin. There were a lot of folks. There were people spread everywhere. So we were running ads and say, look, here are our bankers. Here are their cell numbers. If you need anything, come help us, you know? We had, we had customers coming to us that were actively engaged in cleanup and they needed money, so we were funding money, you know, literally making deals on the back of envelopes. I'm not kidding. And so I think our nimbleness and our ability to go into action and that culture of our company being there for our customers <laughs> was what helped us through those times and, and helped us to, to really grow organically there. Great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I think we do the same thing. Same thing. I think we do this. I mean, I think that you have to help your customers. And, you know, I think the, the regulatory environment is, is the, you know, what they're trying to do is help us help those smaller customers. Um, and so I think we would do the same thing. We would go into action and uh, not that we, we, we would ignore compliance, but we would we'd do whatever it took to help our customers and to, and to make commerce happen again in our, in our, in our local economies. Yes, sir. Has there been any uh, attempt nationally to uh, acquire any power? I know, like, Hibernia, Louisiana, has acquired the capital one. Yep. All that. Well, let me tell you this. We've been independent since uh, 1899, and we have no plans to, uh, to sell our company. Um, the way, to, the way to, to be an independent is having a very, very good, strong stock price. And so we've always uh, aspired to be in the top quartile of our, of our peer companies. We measure ourselves each quarter based on the top 20% uh, percent of, or 25% of companies in the United States. And we look at that every year. And so our desire is to be in the top 25. You get acquired primarily because of weakness, um, and we don't plan to be in a, in a position of weakness. Uh, or you get acquired because it makes sense in a situation like the Whitney and the Hancock uh, situation. Um, but no, that's not uh, that's not something we look we look to or look forward to. Okay. Thank you very much.